Okay, sorry, let me see if I can fix it. Okay. All right, hello everybody. Okay. Hello. Okay, this is not very straight, let me see. Hello, hello everyone. And now I, I hope you can find this now. All right, <clears throat> I have, hello Martin, hello Alex. Very sorry about that. I have no idea what happened. I, I actually recorded a clip to make sure that it worked and it did. So I have no idea what happened. Indrajit, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, I think we have sound. Oh man, I hate this. So now you should be able to hear the guitar. Loud and clear? All right. Okay, I have no idea what happened, but you know, let me just, there you go. Okay, so all my lightning and all my, I had, I had a bunch of screenshots that I wanted to show you and I, I made some tables and some really cool stuff for nothing. All right, again, I'm very sorry. Okay, great. Thanks again. Thank you. So I'll fill out all the information later. And if you were in the other stream, please forgive me as soon as I have a second, I'll delete it and this will be up for good, okay? So now, of course, the camera is not focusing properly, but we'll do our best, okay, in the face of adversity. All right, so there's a few of you. I'm going to get started probably because we've already wasted enough time. I'm sorry, I, I wasted your own time. Okay, so I'm going to get started and uh, let me put you right here so I can read your comments. And if there's any problems, please let me know. Again, I'm, I'm very sorry about that. And... Uh, Anyway, let's get started. So, first of all, thank you very much for being here. I had a whole thank you speech prepared and I think I, I did say it, but to nobody. So, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for all your support, as always. And uh, thanks a lot of you, Indrajit and Alex and, you know, all the people that are always here. You know, it's very much appreciated. And for those of you who are new, welcome. Hello, Martin. Uh, welcome everybody, everyone. Uh, if uh, you don't know about these live master classes and or you're seeing them from the future, we're here every Saturday at 6.30 Central European time. And uh, as always now, keeping in mind my friends from all over the world, the times are 11.30 in Bogota and 10 p.m. in Mumbai. Okay, every week I try to give a shout out to the cities and countries of, of my friends here on, on, on the master class. Okay, so if you want me to mention your city or your country, just go ahead and um, let me know in the comments or in the chat and I'll be more than happy to, if I can figure out what time it is where you live. Okay, but usually it's 6.30 CET and then, you know, you work out your time zone. Um, today we're going to talk about learning the guitar fretboard and uh, I'm going to get into it right away because I've wasted enough of your time. But uh, the problem is, I think we all know that you have to know the notes on the fretboard, right? Doesn't matter what level you're at. And I know a lot of you have, uh, you know, the great guitar players. But I bet some of you have that problem with uh, knowing the guitar in and out, inside and out, because the, the guitar is an instrument that really comes alive when you unlock its architecture. You know, and it's a strange thing to say maybe, but it's so much based on patterns and uh, tabs. You know what I think about tabs, but you know, fingerings, that sometimes we forget that we're playing notes. So we get stuck in, in patterns and um, kind of like in boxes, even with chords. You know, chords become this blob of fingers on the fretboard and notes, but they shouldn't be that, right? Chords should be a, a context, a harmonic context. So sometimes we lose that because we are thinking too much about the shape and where to put the fingers, okay? And most other instruments, they don't work like that. So if you buy a piano, uh, you can't just go like, okay, where's key 27, right? And you count your keys up. You know, you can't do that. You kind of have to know what notes you need to play and, and when to play them and how to play them. And can you guys hear me? 
I just don't want to start again talking to myself. So please let me know. Uh, so, so you know, the piano is an instrument, the violin, you don't even have frets. There's so many instruments uh, that you really need to know, or the theremin, right? If you, you guys have a, that, that back there is a theremin. I can't play it. But uh, when I do play it, unless you use your ears, you know, you, you just, there's no way you can play it because there's no reference points. There's no frets. There's not even no strings. There's nothing. And so playing an instrument becomes extremely important to, to understand how it works. And the guitar is a bit of a mystery. And it's, it's twofold, right? Because when you start, the guitar becomes kind of the easiest instrument you can play. Because for example, if you play the piano, which is also considered a very uh, beginner friendly instrument, the piano, if you want to play in C major, right? It's all the white keys. But then if you just want to play in an innocent, scale, in an innocent key, like E major, now you have to keep in mind that there's four sharps and where the four sharps are, and which ones they are, and then kind of make your fingers do that, right? And so it's a lot harder. But for us guitar players, we, we can just buy the guitar and learn how to play a C major scale, right? And then we can just play it anywhere. We can play it in, in um, G flat major, which has six flats, and we don't even break a sweat, right? We don't care because we're like, okay, that's the same as everything else. So that's one reason why sometimes we don't do what we know we have to do, which is that we have to be able to figure out the guitar. Uh, the other thing is I've seen a lot in students, and the funny thing again is how I see students from all over the world because uh, on the internet, on Skype, I do have students from pretty much every continent, and the problems are so similar, you know, independently of what kind of style they play or what level they're at or, you know, where they were born and raised. And one of them is that they do understand how important it is to know the fretboard, <clears throat> but they have a problem completing the task, right? So they start, uh, they start memorizing the fretboard and because they have the wrong method, they kind of give up because they see no, no improvement. For example, they start memorizing frets on the sixth string, right? Go, working their way up, then on the fifth string, then on the fourth. And what happens with that is that memory alone doesn't work. You remember when you were in school, right? Uh, memory by itself is not enough. And so when you get here, you forgot this, and unless you know how to apply it, then it becomes, you know, you spend weeks doing it and you see no real improvement and you, you, you stop doing it. So we're going to fix that today if that's a problem. And also sometimes people just think that when they start, uh, technique and the scales and uh, chords, they're more important than learning the fretboard, which in a sense it is. You're not wrong if you did that. Because when you are starting out, for example, I started out at 15 and, or 14. At 15, I was already in a band. And in a band, it was, you know, swim or sink, or sink or swim, and I needed to be able to play. So my priority was, can I play the songs and can I improvise when the solo comes up? And, uh, and you know, that was survival, right? So this kind of took a back seat. And uh, I, see, I see this fretboard thing in a similar way to the ear training. A lot of people drop the ear training because it takes a long time. They don't know how to do it. So they spend a lot of work, hours, doesn't go anywhere, and they stop. And uh, also because they have to prioritize. And so again, some things are more urgent, they appear. But benefit-wise, you know, your training is probably the best thing you can do, okay? So if you have had problems with uh, why I'm doing this, and I, even if I want to do it, I can't quite do it, I'm not doing it right. Today, we're gonna straighten it out and I'm gonna give you a few tips. The thing is that I had a bunch of, uh, I made a lot of uh, tables and pictures for the stream, and now I can't use them because I'm on my phone now. So I'm going to try to explain them as, as, as best as I can, and then maybe I will just post them somewhere and you can go and link, you know, with a link and you can just download them, okay? I know the camera is having trouble focusing. I will try to move as little as possible. And again, I do apologize for all the, for all the problems, okay? Indrajit, you say, damn it, is it for the auto, autofocus? There's nothing I can do about it because my lights are controlled by Wi-Fi and they're on the phone. So I will just try to move as little as possible, like that. Okay, but uh, if, it's, if it is unwatchable, I do apologize, but you know, try to hang in there because um, I think it will be useful. It will be very useful for you and maybe you just close your eyes and listen to me, it doesn't matter. Um, maybe you weren't even talking about that, right? But uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, divide it into a few, a few steps we can take. I think step number one, before we go into the deep stuff, as you know, I always like to give different levels of, of um, work. And the first one is really just, for lack of a better word, memorizing the fretboard, but we're not going to do it with memory, okay? We're going to use it 
uh, understanding the fretboard. But this is before we dive into the, my theory of how I do it. Now, this way of learning it is something I came up with. And when I decided that this was it, it was enough, I had to know my, my, my notes. And then I refined it. I had hundreds of students through the years and I refined it with them. And this is the best I came up with and the best thing that I could make sure that works. Okay, if you find other methods, you know, feel free to try them, but this will work for you. And uh, I have little doubt that it will because I've done it so many times and I've seen the results so many times. So you can trust me on this one, but of course, if you want to come up with your own options, you know, go ahead. But I'm gonna show you what I think is the best way to do it. First of all, we're gonna try learning the, the notes in a different way from the chromatic, you know, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, and then we work our way down to the fifth string and do the same. You know, that becomes, gets old pretty quick, gets boring, and also you start forgetting the first things you learned. So what I do is learn note by note. <clears throat> so we're gonna start from E, just because it's the easiest thing on the guitar. If it was another instrument, we might start on C, but we're gonna do E first because it's the first string we run into. And uh, we're gonna do it like this. We're gonna find all the E's on the guitar, okay? And um, you can write it down on a piece of paper, right? And uh, you look for all the E's, so there's a zero, open string, there's a 12. I'm going to stick to 22 frets because I know a lot of you have 22 fret guitars. If you have 21 or 24, you can just adapt, okay? Then there's one here on the seven. Then there's one here on the, let's do just the first 12 frets. So it's zero, seven, two, nine, five, and that's it, because the first string is the same as the sixth. So if we only have five notes, now this becomes a lot more manageable, right? Because everything repeats after the 12th fret, so that's no issue at all. Just look at the dots on, the, on your fretboard or add 12 to them. But what, what started out as kind of an undecipherable instrument like the guitar, now becomes a lot more manageable because we're only really dealing with five notes. Zero, seven, two, nine, five. Now the first string is the same as the six, so it's zero. And then everything above will have to be the same as the first 12 frets. So that already takes a good chunk of, um, of problems out of it, okay? And of fear and of apprehension and of intimidation because now you know that you can do this with just five notes. So that's the first thing. And what I would do is the following. I would just start with the sixth string and play zero, 12. I know it's nothing and maybe you are beyond this point, but if you're starting out, that's what I would do for a couple of minutes, zero, 12, that's it. Maybe I can say E, E. And then when I'm ready, which is probably soon enough, I will move down to the fifth string and play seven, and 19. So I would go 7, 19 a couple of minutes, and then as soon as I feel ready, I would do 0, 12, 7, 19. 0, 12, 7, 19. That's what I would do to begin with. Then maybe I will add the next string. So 2, 14, you know, just write it down if you have to, you can read it, no problem. When you think you've got it, then you add it to the previous strings. You don't have to play it as fast, of course. Just take your time. And uh, wait, I'm gonna lower the camera just a little bit. Sorry about that. On oh my, maybe I shouldn't touch anything, right? After what happened, but I'm gonna lower it just a little bit. Okay, so I think you can see it better. I'll never learn to not touch stuff. Eh, better? Okay. So, right, so we have um, the, the first three strings. Now you'll work on all the strings. So you'll do 0, 12, 7, 19, 12, 14, 9, 21, 5, 17, and that's it. If you've got 24 frets, feel free to add them. That's E. Then tomorrow you'll work on the next string, which is A. Now we don't work on F. We don't work, we don't do E, F, F sharp, because then it becomes mechanical. Then you'll know that the zero is an E, so I just add a, add a fret and it's F and then tomorrow I'll add two frets and it's F sharp. But that brings you right back to what we want to avoid, which is memorizing the fretboard fret by fret. Okay, so that's a big problem. And I see that it doesn't work. So you don't want to fall into that trap. So my suggestion is do the first strings, the open strings first. So E, then you work your A's, then the D's, the G's and the B's, right? So A would be again, start on the sixth string, five, mm -hmm. 17. 
a few times. When you feel like you're ready, add the, the fifth string, which is 012. Spend your time there, whatever you need. Then go to the fourth string. Then the third, right? Work them out separately if you have to, and then you put them together at whatever speed you want. Of course, it doesn't have to be... Wait. Talking and doing things at the same time is pretty hard. But you don't have to do it at this speed. You can do it at any speed you want. If you, if you want to set your metronome, even 60 BPMs every four beats, you play a note. It doesn't matter. Okay, just do it. Do it a few times and it will get better. Now, as soon as you're done with your strings, you can add the F and the C, right? Because those are the naturals that are missing. Always keep them separate. If we just did the B, don't do the C. You know, do the F, then do the C, and then you can do all the flats and sharps, okay? And maybe do it a few times. The five notes that are sharp, do it a few times with calling them sharp, and a few times calling them flat. Okay, so that's your, pre your, your, your preparation for whatever comes next. And you really kind of have to know this pretty well to continue. And a lot of people I've seen stop here, which is okay. You know, you'll know your, fret, your fretboard. But the problem is that this exercise, it's kind of like um, one of those things that if you stop doing it, it, it kind of goes away and it runs away from you. Yeah. So it's better if you then develop something that you can use to always keep it going in your head when you play. Okay, I've seen people do this and then stop for a few months and they kind of start losing it. Okay, so that's why I developed the next few steps. And uh, I'm going to explain them to you. I had my notes here with reference to my, to my slides that I prepared, but I'm just going to explain it and hopefully you'll make sense of it. Okay, so the first thing you have to understand about the, the, the notes on the guitar is that everything can be defined by three axes. Okay, it's very simple. One, of course, is the note, the name of the note, right? G or, or whatever it is. And uh, the next thing is the string, right? And then you have a fret. So you have an auditory thing, which is a note, and then you have the vertical thing and the horizontal. So basically, any note on the fretboard can be defined by these three things. Okay, so if I play here a G on the second string on the eighth fret, this note is defined by being on the second string, on the eighth fret, and by being a G. Not any G, right? It's not any G. It's a specific G on, the, on your, if you use uh, standard notation, it's a specific G at a specific pitch, right? This would be a different G. Correct? So that's the main thing. You can define anything on the fretboard by these three axes. And uh, the trick here is to use two axes to find the missing one. Okay, and so there are three possible combinations of two axes. You can have, uh, let's see, we can do first, you can have a string and a fret, and then you have to find the note. You can have a fret and uh, a string and a note, and you have to find the fret. And then you can have the other one, which is the strangest one we'll look at, which is having a, a fret and a note and having to find the string. Okay, so each of these three things has a specific benefit. And learning like this is a following step to, to memorizing, which is basically what we did in the first exercise. And it will help you move your fretboard knowledge beyond memorization and slowly move it towards your musical mind, which means that every time you play and every time you improvise and every time you compose music or you hear music in your head, it will always be there, right? You'll always have this this understanding of the fretboard and it's not going to be a memory anymore a memory exercise it will actually be part of your playing kind of like when you when you move your fingers on an exercise people who don't know how to practice properly they learn a, a, a technique exercise and that's what they're learning they're learning that specific exercise but a good student or you know with a good teacher uh, or, or just a student by himself if he can figure out how to learn a technique exercise and transcend that exercise to access the deeper benefit of it, then he will use whatever he learns on that exercise for everything else, okay? Because, we, you know, you don't need a hundred exercises. You can just need a few, and, and then as soon as you learn of something that you can't quite do well, then you can make up a new exercise, you don't find one, and do it. It's not enough to just play. You have to understand why you're playing it, and understand as you benefit from that exercise how you can you know, eventually uh, implement it into your playing. Then it will always be there. Because if you learn how to play your, with your pick properly, not just as an exercise, but as actually understanding the mechanics of it, 
then every time you play, you will be reinforcing and even uh, bettering what, what you've studied. Okay, so this is the same with the fretboard, it's the same with your training, it's the same with everything. It's a pretty deep concept, but it's, uh, it's very interesting and, and important. So let's start with the first combination. The first combination is string and fret. Okay, we're going to use this same exercise, which was uh, the eighth fret on the second string. So what we want is we want to be able to look at this note and go like, okay, that's a G, right? We want to be able to look at this and go, oh, here's a B, and this is an F sharp, but this is a C and this is a B flat, right? This is what we want to learn. We want to be able to deduce what note we're playing from basically seeing it on the fretboard. Okay, so the benefit of this is uh, there are many benefits, but the main one maybe you can come up with is if you're playing with somebody else and you see them play something on the neck, then you'll know how, you know, what they're playing, what key they're in, and so on. So if, if I'm playing with you and you play a bunch of chords, I need to be able to, to figure out what chords they're playing. And sometimes you're not playing the obvious things. Sometimes you're playing your own shapes, and I need to be able to see these and go like, okay, well, those notes are these notes, so I can play this scale over it. Okay, this is a very uh, simple but extremely important application of this. So it's more of a reaction thing. So you see something and you figure out what it is that, that you want to play or what they're playing. The other thing is uh, the opposite. Like you're playing with somebody and they play a melody for you. And you go like, okay, well, what is he doing? So you look at what they're doing and you figure out what key they're in. Then you can play chords over it. You can play harmonies, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, so the first thing is if I have my string and a fret, can I find what note is being played? So in the slide that I had prepared, there were three columns. One of them was the fret, one was the string, and one was the note. Okay, you can imagine a, an Excel sheet. Notes, fret, and, and, and uh, string. If you have all three, of course, that's it, that's done. But we're going to use only two at a time. So the first one you're going to use the, the string and the fret. So imagine a column filled with numbers one to six. Those are your six strings. So you can write them down randomly, one, five, three, two, six, four, five, one, three, four, a hundred times, two hundred times, whatever you want to do. And then you will have a different column with frets. And depending on where you're at, you can do just the first 12 frets or 11 frets if you want to study the first half, or you can do the full 24 frets or just the last uh, 24 frets, you know, the last 12 frets, whatever you want to do. I would suggest do it with all frets. So in the second column, you'll have uh, uh, 6, 18, 3, 5, 7, 8, uh, 2, 15, whatever it is, you know, a hundred columns of that, I mean a hundred rows, okay, so you have that. And here you have an empty column where it's the note. And you can do this anywhere, you can do it with the guitar or without the guitar, which is also incre incredibly beneficial, and you basically do that. So if, if the first one is uh, string 4 fret 6, you go like E flat. You can write it down or just say it. Then you can go, okay, uh, fret uh, 3 on the, or higher, maybe 15 on the third string, B flat. And then the same fret but on the second string, D, right? So you have this thing. You want to write it down first on a piece of paper or, or on Excel sheet because you don't want to say it yourself because there's two risks. One of them is that you just go back to the usual stuff. And the other one is that while you say the string and the fret, you're already thinking of what's coming what note it is, and you should, it should take you by surprise. So that's why I said, do it randomly, write it down, and do like hundreds of them. So you can always start from the middle, you can start from the, the bottom, you can start from the top. I had a student once who knew how to program a computer to give him random uh, columns. So if you know how to do that, you know, that's even easier. Otherwise, just write down 300 columns and you'll be good, okay? So that's the first level, and it's uh, incredibly useful, as we said, for jamming, for understanding the musical context you're in, if you're playing with somebody to understand what they're doing and to kind of react to the music you see somebody playing, okay? Can you guys hear me all right? I think so because there's a few of you watching, but let me know. And of course, let me know if you have any questions. I'll go back to it later and um, we'll, of course, at the end of this session, we'll have a Q&A as always, okay? So that was the first combination. Please just imagine these columns, right? The, the, this table, so you have string fret and an empty column for notes and you fill it out. Uh, the second combination of two axes and finding the final axis is having the string and the note. Okay, so imagine the same column, but now we have a bunch of rows with uh, one, five, six, two, three, one, whatever the string is, randomly, 
and another column with um, uh, the notes. So we do random notes. You can do G, B flat, A, C, D, E sharp if you want. It doesn't matter. All the notes that you want to study, which should be all of them. Okay, so you make Manish. Okay, you can hear me. Great. Thanks. Thanks. I'm a bit uh, apprehensive now after what happened. Okay, so you have these two columns. And why do we study these two axes? The reason here is a bit different. It's not uh, so much as a reaction to what you see being played, but it's more of a creative thing. Not better. Not better. You'll need all three anyway. But it's, it's more of a, you want to play a certain note and you have to be able to do that and find it. So that's why we studied the second set. And uh, for example, you might, a great example of why you want to play in a key, because you use the first combination to figure out that this guy is playing a bunch of chords in E. And now I have to play E, the scale, and I, I, I like how this note G sounds. over that E chord is playing, right? Or, you know, anything else. But the idea here is that you have, uh, you're playing somewhere on the neck, so on a certain string, and you need a certain note because you're playing in that note, you're, you're in the key, you're improvising in the key, you're given a chart that just gives you chords and you have to play over them, or you want to compose music, you know, whatever it is you want to do. So you practice that again by having uh, strings on one side, notes on the other, and you fill out the fret. Now this is a bit more, more difficult because I don't know why, but it seems to be a bit harder to do. Okay, but this is basically what you what you find if your teacher says, okay, uh, play me a B on the second string, right? Or play me a C on the third, play me an F on the fifth. The first combination was more like, what note is this? What note is this? What note is this? What note is this? Which one is this? How about that? See, these are the two main things you'll find uh, applications for in music and in your playing. Those are the two main ones, okay? Uh, the third one is a bit stranger, and it's not something that you can practice as easily as the first two. And I'll explain. So we did string and fret and string and note. But now, if you want to start with the fret and the note and find the string, it becomes a bit harder because not all strings have a certain note on a certain fret. Okay, as a matter of fact, there's 12 notes and only five strings, really, because the sixth repeats. So basically, if you do it randomly, you, you'll only get a right one every, you know, five out of 12, because for us, the other seven notes never occur on a certain fret. So to do this, you have to kind of work it out first, or maybe do it with somebody who knows what they're doing, a teacher or, or a friend who really knows his fretboard. And then you can practice it. And uh, so what you can do is, is the following. Now you have, uh, I have a string and I have a, I have a note and I have a fret. So my columns could be the fret is five and the note is E. And then in the string, you'll have to write down second because the second string has an E on the, on the fifth fret. Maybe you have a uh, fret nine and the string is three. I'm sorry, no. I just gave it away. Fret 9 and the note is E and there's only a string which is a third that has that note. Right? You see that? You see what I'm doing? So the benefits of this are a bit more abstract. I can't think of a great examples like the other two, but uh, it, it is, I find it to be extremely useful to test your knowledge because it's a lot harder to do. So even if it's just for that, it's great. You can practice the first two combinations and then come to these combinations to really go like, okay, now I really know what I'm doing. Uh, the only problem, as I said, don't do it randomly. Write your column of all the notes, you know, a hundred different notes, and then make sure that those notes do exist on the frets you put in the second column. And then the, the empty column will be the one you, you find the string for. Okay, um, I've been thinking about a, a specific use for this, but I can't find it except that, uh, and I, I thought about this a long time because I've been teaching this for a long time. And uh, the main benefit is really that it will certainly measure your knowledge of the fretboard. It's extremely, uh, you know, it, it's very telling. If you, if you take forever to figure it out, it means you're not ready to, you know, you're, you don't have it down enough. And so I would suggest you just use it like that and uh, practice it just as much as the other three, as the other two. But I would start definitely with string and fret because you can practice this with anyone. They can go like, what note is this? 
and you go, that's that note. What note is this? Or maybe better said, that's an F, and this is an E, this is an F, this is a D, this is a G, right? This is an E, this is an A flat. Then move on to the second level, which is the string and the note. So basically I go like, okay, I, I will ask you to play a certain note. I will say, play a, a G on the fifth string, play an E on the second string, play a, a B flat on the first, right? And finally, I will say, what string has a G on the third fret? None. Okay, oh, sorry, the sixth. But we, I, I was gonna say the fourth fret. Which, which string has a, has a G on the fourth fret? And you'll be wrecking your brain with this and you'll never find the answer. So you find somebody who really knows what they're doing. Okay, so that's uh, basically what I would do. And without my slides, hopefully it's not confusing. Uh, please let me know if it's all clear. I will go over it one more time in summary, okay? But let me see, uh, do you prefer switching notes with the chords or maybe play a scale which fits the whole progression? Okay, uh, Indraji, we're gonna leave that for right after I'm done with the fretboard thing because I think that's a more of a separate question, but certainly I'll answer at the end of the masterclass for sure. So as a matter of fact, I think I'm pretty much done, but I'm going to go over it again really quick, okay? So the first exercise you should do is simply learning one note at a time. This is the E, then you would do with A. Then you would do it with D. Then you would do it with G and so on. The order doesn't matter, do it in any order you want, but don't do it chromatically. Okay, because then you start thinking, oh, F is like E plus one, and that's not really good, all right? So that's the first thing. Then we talked about how each note on the fretboard is defined by three axes. One is the note, the name of the note, and the pitch of the note, because there are many Gs, of course, but there's a certain one that we're interested in. Then the fret, where it falls on the fretboard, and the string, where it intersects that fret, and that gives you that specific note. So those three things give you everything you need to know to find or play any note on the guitar. And uh, then we, we separated those three axes into sets of two axes. And the first combination was to have a string and a fret and figure out the note. And we said that that assumed something like this. One note is this, one note is this, one note is this, one note is this, one note is that. Something a teacher might do with you. And uh, basically they have to know what they're doing because they have to know if your answer is correct. And you can practice it by writing, filling out full sheets of Excel with a bunch of frets and a bunch of strings and leaving the notes empty and you just fill them out yourself. The second combination was string and note. And then you, ha you have to find what fret. And uh, the more, the more um, practical way of looking at this is that I'm asking you to play certain notes. So I, play, I say play a B flat on the third string, play a G on the second, play a, an F sharp on the third, and you just go ahead and play them. And uh, that's extremely useful, of course, for anything you want to play on the neck to be able to access it really quick. And the third one, which we said we didn't have much use, but it was extremely useful to practice because it really takes care of of your agility and your mental readiness to, to know the fretboard is to have uh, the note and the fret and figuring out the string. Just an extra word of caution for this was that, of course, there are only five strings, but there are 12 notes. So you have to know what you're doing. Otherwise, you'll ask somebody for something impossible. You'll ask for a note that does not exist on a certain fret. Okay, so that's the only thing and you can't do it randomly. You have to know what you're doing or find somebody who does. Okay, so if you do, how long would it take? Um, I think to become quite proficient, maybe just weeks, maybe just weeks. To become pretty good at it, I think a few months. In a few months, you'll, you'll always see the fretboard as, uh, as a bunch of notes, right? And there are ways you can even go beyond this, but we're not going to get into them today. It takes quite a bit of work, but basically you'll be able to see whole groups of notes at the same time and understanding the relationships. And for that, you really have to study your intervals and your triads. So we're going to get to that uh, some other time. Okay. But it's extremely useful, but without this is going to be extremely hard to do. So my suggestion, if you're not quite ready yet, I would like to know how many of you in the chat room 
feel that they really know the fretboard. Could you, could you just write it down because it would be great for me to see. And if you're watching this later, uh, let me know in the comments. It's, I'm not trying to get you to comment, it's just I'm very interested to know because I know so many people who are actually good guitar players and still they have no real way of interfacing with the instrument. And this will help you a lot. So please let me know what, what your current situation is. Really interesting, always struggling on real-time node location. We'll try to be less lazy and perform these exercises every day. I'm tired of locating notes by octave shapes. Yes. Okay, Alex, uh, let me get to this question first because it's so much related to this. So Alex is an extremely, um, Alex is an extremely good guitar player, of course, if you guys heard him. Uh, and uh, see, he, he thinks he needs a lot of work. Maybe he's just being humble, probably, but still it, it is something that will benefit him so much with everything he's doing that, but you see how he's developed so much great technique and he's developed a lot of um, agility. You know, he can write songs, he can write great solos, he can play great, he has a great sound. And yet this thing kind of slipped you know, between his fingers. So it's something that's huge. I try to focus on these masterclasses on things that will be very useful to a lot of people because I know what things people kind of leave behind. And ear training is certainly something I want to do. But you see how uh, even great players sometimes are lacking here. Let's see. Indrajit, not the complete fretboard. All right. And Red, hello, Red. Hello, good to see you. NC52, uh, you know it, okay, great, great to hear, yeah, well then you're good, approved. I have my stamp of approval for, uh, Alex says, not being humble, <laughs> playing alone is a totally different thing, no real-time collaboration with other musicians and all those things. I always take my time to do things. All right, well, that is a good way of working too. You know, the thing is, um, yeah, going out to play, we talked about it last week, right, with scales it's kind of the, the ultimate test. You know, you're out there with your guitar and um, you might as well be naked, right? Because it's intimidating. Indrajit, I'm going to get to your question. I'm going to get to your question, which was, do you prefer switching notes with the chord or maybe play a scale which fits the chord progression? Well, it depends. Uh, sometimes, for example, in a lot of my songs, um, sometimes uh, the, the chord progression doesn't really fit any scale. And I, I keep thinking of making one of those inside the song videos about a song called Midnight Driver, which has a chord progression in the solo that is chromatic chords. So it's and then it's like that. And so the problem with that, of course, is that no scale unless you're playing the chromatic scale, which was which would be kind of weird, right? Playing a solo like that, uh, no scale will fit those chords. So uh, what I do is the following. Sometimes I play over whole progression. If, if they fit, great, and I can do that. Uh, sometimes I try to figure out, even if I can play a scale over all these chords, is there a way that I can mix it up? Yeah, so can I take two chords and take them as C major, for example? Can I take these other two chords and take them as C mixolydian or C lydian or, you know, another scale? Uh, you can always do it with pentatonics, of course. You can always switch from pentatonic to major because they're included in the major. Uh, sometimes I take every chord as a, as a key, and that's more common in jazz. But really for that, I find that in the music I play, you know, in rock music, I think um, to do that, you kind of have to have longer uh, or a slower tempo or longer uh, sections of each chord, right? So if you have like every four, every four beats, a different chord, it becomes, it becomes very hard to do, but not just difficult to do because you can figure it out, but it becomes hard to listen to, to somebody jumping from one scale to the other, right? And uh, it kind of becomes what we talked about last time, right? It becomes a, a technical thing or a, a kind of like a, a nerdy thing in a good, in a, you know, nerd is a, not a bad word, but I, I want to use it in a bad way here. So it becomes something like that you just do it for everybody else to see that you can switch from one chord to the other. And I don't enjoy that. It distracts me from the music. So I try not to do that too much, right? If it's a long chord progression with a chord that stays for a couple of bars and then goes to another one, then yes. But I will always try to find bridges between them. Yeah. So for example, if I have two chords that have nothing to do with each other, maybe uh, say C major and um, maybe I have a C major and uh, 
E flat major, right? So C major has no sharps and no flats, and E flat major has three flats. Forget for a second that they're kind of relative scales, but I would kind of go like, okay, can I play maybe C mixolydian over the C? Because C mixolydian has one flat. So it kind of, you know, it, it, it brings me a bit closer to the other side that I'm looking for. And then maybe I try to find if E flat, is there a scale, maybe, can I play Lydian over E flat? Because Lydian will lose one flat and bring it up one step on the circle of fifths if you want to look at it in the circle of fifths. So instead of being three notes away, if I play C major to E major, there are three notes away. There are three flats in E flat major, no flats in C major. So out of the seven notes, three notes will change. That's quite, almost half of them. But if I can figure out maybe to play Mixolydian here and Lydian here, then there will only be one note difference, you see? And then I can, I can smooth it out and I can do a lot more. You can even just ignore that extra note and you'll only be missing one out of seven, not three out of seven. Does it make sense? Um, Alex says, totally true. Yeah, great. I'm glad that it makes sense. I learned the fretboard in kind of a weird way. I learned all the triads and their notes. Well, that is a great way to do it, Red. Red Walrus. Yeah. And uh, that's something, okay, the camera is going crazy with the autofocus. And I do apologize again, please allow me to do that and thank you for being here and uh, <laughs> keeping up with it and yes a red walrus i think triads are extremely important i've been trying to figure out a way to do a master class on them and they're such a big subject and i'm still trying to understand how i can do it justice in a master class like this because don't forget that these things are a bit hard to do because i have no idea who i'm talking to i do know a lot of you guys but I really don't know how you play and I don't know what your knowledge is. So I'm trying to do it in a way that's at the same time uh, universal and at the same time specific to your needs. And uh, I haven't figured out how to do it with triads yet, but I will do uh, a class on, on triads. And Indraji says, interesting. Yeah, then you can try it out. You can try it with your, with your chords. So I'm open to more questions, of course. I'm in no rush to leave, although uh, you know, the technical problems kind of take the wind out of something like this. But, you know, we sold your own. Yeah, triads. Kike. Oh, yeah, Kike loves triads. I know, you can't wait. Kike knows his notes on the fretboard. Not looking bad on this end. Oh, thanks. But I, I, do, I think you see a bunch of, a lot of autofocus on the camera. And uh, yeah, and you weren't there at the beginning. We had, a, I had to restart the stream and so on. But yeah, thank you. You guys are too kind as always. And uh, you put up with me, but you know, I spent so much time playing the guitar and learning this stuff that I can teach you now that I never learned how to use uh, streaming programs. All right, so if you have any more questions, I'll wait for a couple of minutes and uh, otherwise we'll just uh, leave it at that. Next, uh, this Tuesday's uh, Inside the Song will be on artificial harmonics, which is kind of cool, and how to use them uh, as part of your melody instead of like random sounds. And uh, it's a cool song that uses them. I won't tell you which one, but you'll figure out, on, you'll find out on Tuesday. And uh, I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Okay. So I don't see any questions here on the feed. I hope you found this useful and uh, that you could figure out what I was talking about of, you know, with the columns and the axes and all that stuff. If there's any issues with it, you know, if you, if you run into any problems, let me know next week. I'll be here again, of course, at 6.30 my time and uh, we'll do it again and if you have any questions we'll we'll answer them okay so no problems there and uh, i will leave this up of course like all the master classes uh problems and all because uh, that's live music right all right so i see no more questions coming so maybe we'll just uh, leave it at that all right well then again Accept my apologies for the technical problems and my thanks for being understanding and for being here. And uh, if you are new here and you're watching this later, 
please make sure you subscribe. Oh, one thing, actually, yes, please subscribe and all the good stuff, li like and comment, because I'm having trouble with this video uh, reaching more people. But when, once people are reached, they seem to respond very well. So I'm, I'm going to keep doing them and see how it works, all right? But one thing, though, if you are subscribed, I figured out why nobody's being served notifications, because something happened that a lot of my subscribers the bell went to the middle level instead of the no notification level. So maybe you want to check that, all right? Because a few people asked, why am I not getting notified? I think that might be it. Um, I have one account that I use for testing and that went from full notification to the half one and sometimes I didn't get notified. So maybe something you want to check out. Thank you very much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you next Saturday. Anything you need, any, any questions, uh, stuff like that, just feel free to leave it in the comments. Keep the conversation going. Any suggestions for future masterclasses, feel free to let me know and I'll do my best. All right. I hope uh, all is well. Have a great remaining of the weekend and a great week. And I'll see you next Saturday. All right. See you soon, everybody. Bye bye. And thanks again for your understanding. And now let's see if I can turn this off. Bye. See you.